Welcome to Educate, Agitate, Organise Saturday. Uh, delighted this week to be joined by my co-host, Jane Aitchison. Jane, how are you doing? I'm really well. It's brilliant to be here again. Thanks, Matt. And Jane, um, what are we talking about this week? Well, we're talking about the uh, the police uh, bill uh, that's currently on its way through Parliament and threatens to stop our fundamental right to protest. And so it's absolutely brilliant that we've managed to get Richard Bergen, uh, Leeds East Labour MP, here to speak on that for us today. Fantastic. Um, let's go to interview. It's been called an opportunistic crackdown on freedom of speech and civil liberties. Unite the Union have called it out of control authoritarianism. I am, of course, talking about the controversial police, crime and sentencing bill. Uh, tonight, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the Member of Parliament for Leeds East and Secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, Richard Bergen. Richard, thank you for joining us. Great to see you, Matt. How are you doing? I'm very well, Richard. Thanks for asking. Um, so, look, there's there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm I'm really grateful you could make the time to join us to share with us, you know, your expertise, your knowledge, your insights into this emerging, really, really vital campaign against this hugely egregious bill. Um, I want to make a start with, well, look, so it's a huge document, 307 pages, um, 176 clauses, and the the bits that are seem to be causing the most contention um, in, in, in the eyes of the public uh, are the elements around, and obviously it's a big bill, but the elements around public order in particular um, have been particularly egregious. Now, these sections are not supported by a white paper or a green paper. Um, there's been no draft bill so i mean what's the government's what's the tories justification for this well fundamentally it's political just as everything is when you get to the uh, the bottom of it and what this is about really this bill is part and parcel of the authoritarian drift that we've seen under Boris Johnson and the Conservatives. We've seen that in relation to the spy cops bill. We've seen that in relation to this police crackdown bill. We've seen it in relation to the overseas operation bill and the other examples uh, of other authoritarian worrying moves as well. What the Conservatives are doing, I think, they're actually trying to remove people's ability to resist. They're trying to remove people's ability to fight back and the reason the Conservatives are doing this is because they know that in the economic crisis that we're in, the Conservatives are going to make the political choice to pursue policies against the interests of the majority and against the interests of discriminated against minorities as well. And they want to remove people's ability to fight back against this. So I think really that this bill is part and parcel of that. And if they try to remove our ability to resist, we can only respond with greater resistance. So this, so, so this government trying to stop us using our voices, trying to stop us from 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 speaking out, is is that what makes this bill particularly dangerous in your view? I think it is. Uh, it's in essence uh, making uh, protests all but illegal. It's like we've seen with strike action, but on an even greater scale. The Conservatives uh, in government haven't made going on strike illegal, but they've made it harder to go on strike uh, lawfully. And it's the same with this, isn't it? You can protest just as long as it's not too loud, just as long as it doesn't inconvenience anybody, just as long as it's where uh, the police say the protest can be uh, and the rest of it. So you can protest as long as it doesn't really achieve what a protest uh, is meant to uh, do. So it's really worrying, really authoritarian. Look, for example, we've got ways of fighting back, fighting back through strike action, fighting back at the ballot box, uh, fighting back through protest. And all of those three areas have been or are being attacked by the government as part of this authoritarian drift. We're trying to bring in voter ID, which will actually suppress the votes in working class and black and minority ethnic communities thus hampering people's ability to fight back through the ballot box. They're trying to um, make it much easier to protest and protest uh, effectively, therefore hampering people's ability to fight back uh, through 
uh, protests, and as I've said already, uh, through their anti-trade union legislation, they've made it much more difficult uh, for uh, workers to go on strike. So all of these three things are part of our democracy because democracy isn't just uh, about voting in a general election every few years. Democracy is fundamental. What happens between elections as well? You know, protest is part of uh, democracy. Strike action is part of democracy. And yes, of course, voting in elections is part of democracy as well. All of these things, obviously, historically, weren't gifted to us by those at the top. All of these rights and freedoms had to be wrestled from the establishment by progressive working class movements. And that's what the Conservatives are trying to undermine now. They don't want people to be able to fight back against uh, their uh, unpopular policies uh, and their dangerous agenda. I think, you know, really interesting points there. Really, I think it's it's worth emphasising as well. So, look, I mean, they'll never out and out say... They'll never, they'll, they'll never ban protests. They'll never say we're banning protests. They'll never say we're banning strikes, but they'll make it increasingly difficult. And I think, um, so we had, for example, we had, we had some comrades on from Labour Black Socialists a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about one, one, of, the, one of the key concerns here is you, you're effectively, you are putting political decisions in the hands of the police. And, I mean... Th- that lets the gov- government off the hook. They can say, oh, well, you know, we, we were quite happy for you to have a protest, but, you know, the police made the, the decision and that's in the legislation. I mean, that's really dangerous, isn't it? I mean, what's, what's your view on that? Well, I think uh, th- there's a lot of truth uh, in that. And we've seen uh, the police behave differently uh, in different areas. Uh, I wasn't able to attend, but the reports I had back from the um, Kill the Bill protest uh, in Leeds Uh, was that the uh, police facilitated that, they didn't obstruct that protest. But then we see the appalling um, scenes from Bristol uh, of police brutality. We saw as well the appalling scenes of the way police were treating uh, women at the Sarah uh, Everard uh, vigil. So there is different approaches by uh, the police on different occasions in different parts uh, of the country. And we all know uh, what happens when uh, Tory governments uh, start to try to use the police for their own political ends. We saw that, for example, uh, in the miners' strike, didn't we, uh, where uh, police from the London Met were drafted up to the coal fields uh, and used in that very uh, politicised uh, way. And, yeah, again, so we, we, we had um, comrades from the All Grieve campaign on... Um a few a few weeks back and um you know they, they, they drew a they drew a straight line from what happened in Orgreave and the, the scenes we saw last summer with a, a bat on charge against um Black Lives Matter demonstrators. Um how worried should we be about an increase in police powers? We should be very uh, worried uh, about an increase uh, in police powers. I mean some of the measures in this bill actually the police aren't calling for themselves either. For example, the measures in this bill, which are really discriminatory against the traveller community, uh, those extra powers of criminalisation, the police have actually said they don't want those extra powers in relation to travellers. So you've got to ask yourself this question. If you're giving extra powers to the police that in that instance the police don't want, then what's going on here? It's clearly uh, a political uh, agenda from the government, as I say, trying to... Uh, stop people having the power to fight back. In relation to the issue of discrimination against travellers, it seems to me it's part and parcel uh, of what some people have called the government's culture wars, where they're trying to really consolidate the support um, of the right wing in the country behind them. So a kind of coalition between people who've always voted Conservative, people who have voted for far-right parties or haven't voted in the past, but... Uh, espouse far-right politics, bringing that together as a permanent uh, coalition. And I think that's what um, some of the awful anti-traveller discrimination in this bill is about as well. It's playing politics in the crudest and most uh, ugly and discriminatory of senses. So would would you say it's, it's, it's in a sense, a kind of culture war... Dog whistle. Of course, and it's not the only time that the uh, the Conservatives uh, have done it. I mean, the Conservatives have got it on uh, local uh, election uh, leaflets about Labour MPs uh, voting against uh, the this bill and they're saying that this shows that we're uh, soft on travellers or soft on illegal activities. And 
those very ideas are awful, aren't they? The idea of being uh, soft on travellers, not looking at the uh, the root cause of the situation, which is that actually local authorities need to be properly funded so that there are, there are um, sufficient uh, sites for travellers, decent sites available uh, for them to use because the real problem is the lack of facilities for travellers. And you don't solve that problem by criminalising the people who don't have enough facilities. So from what you said, it, it, it seems like, so this is a, a real cynical attempt by the Tories to, to, to use legislation to, to really kind of drive a wedge in our society, to, to exacerbate existing anxieties around uh, marginalised groups, to radically extend the, the powers that police have, in, in many instances, powers that they don't want, um, and to almost like, it's, it's almost as though they're preempting a huge amount of public outcry as a result of the policies that they're implementing in the future, and so they're beefing up the potential, the potential that the state has to, to, to push back against ordinary people who are just standing up for themselves. So, Look, this 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 legislation. It's a it's a committee stage uh, now. So after that, it will go to to report, um, and then there's a, a third reading. I understand. So it's still making its way through uh, the House of Commons, and obviously it'll go to the House of Lords. How can people watching this program? How can they engage uh, with politicians to to, to 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 lobby against it? And how can they engage outside of uh, outside of government? Well, I think there needs to be a struggle against this bill in Parliament and outside Parliament as well. I think the protests against this bill uh, have been incredibly. Uh, important because it's standing up for the right to peacefully protest. It's standing up uh, for our hard-won uh, democratic rights. We can't just leave this to uh, MPs, especially when the Conservatives have an 80-seat majority. So there needs to be a campaign outside Parliament and there needs to be activity inside Parliament as well. I'm glad that the Labour leadership uh, is opposing uh, this bill. And so much of the activity in terms of lobbying MPs has to be concentrated, I think, uh, on those MPs who aren't currently opposing the bill, and that means uh, Conservative uh, MPs. And I think that an appeal can be made to some Conservative MPs on the basis uh, of civil liberties. We need to break up uh, the, uh, the Conservative consensus uh, on this bill. But I say we shouldn't leave it to um, MPs in Parliament. You know, we need protests uh, across uh, the country. Uh, we need people to be talking about this on social media. We need people to be holding discussions about this and holding meetings, whether it's Zoom meetings or whether it's social distance discussions uh, in the local park, for example, as happened uh, in Leeds at the weekend. All of these things uh, are important because when I said earlier about what is democracy, democracy isn't just voting in general elections. Democracy isn't just MPs in Parliament either. By taking part in peaceful protests, by taking part in discussions, uh, by lobbying, all of these things are democracy uh, as well. And all of these things are grassroots democracy, which is the most important democracy of all, really. So the, the so the Tories have, 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 well, they say they've paused the progress of this, this legislation for the time being. Obviously, there has been a very strong public outcry. Do you think? Do you think that means that? Um, what's the motivation between the behind them pausing that legislation? Do you think the protests are working? Well, I think the protests are important, and I think the protests need to uh, carry on and should be supported. But I don't think people should think uh, that we can rest on our laurels and assume that the Conservatives are going to drop this bill or drop the uh, most unpalatable and most egregious elements uh, of this bill. You know, the Conservatives are a ruthless political entity. They're operating for a class interest. And as I say, what I think this is about, is actually about two things. One, removing people's right to fight back, removing people's right to resist effectively when unpopular policies uh, against the interests of the majority and against the interests of discriminating against minorities are on the way. But also, it's about trying to divide the country and so the Conservatives probably think that there's some electoral advantage to them in pursuing what the right-wing papers may portray as the bogeymen of our age, whether that be environmental protesters, Black Lives Matter protesters, trade unionists or travellers. 
And I think the Conservatives think there's some political capital for them to gain out of that divide, for them to gain uh, out of making the target, um, the people I've mentioned, um, marginalised groups and progressive campaigns and trade unionists. So given that, I don't think we should underestimate the Conservatives' uh, determination uh, to push this through. Really glad, really glad you, you mentioned the class consciousness of the of the Tories there because it, it does not it does not get talked about enough just how how um, class aware they are and how class focused everything they do is as a project. One of the things that's been remarked upon um, quite often actually is the real the real breadth of the coalition in opposition to this. I mean, it really does. It, it you know it's it, it represents the working class in. All its diversity. Do, do you think there's do you think there's an opportunity here to build a kind of a, a class conscious resistance to this in in a way that we've not really seen since, for example, I don't know the the the, co- the poll tax. Well, class consciousness has never gone away on the part of the people that run society. And if the Labour Party had been as class conscious through its history as the Conservative Party has been, then certainly I think we'd have been in power a lot more, and certainly we'd have been uh, far more. Uh, ruthless and far more effective uh, electorally in every, and in every other way throughout our history. I mean, the Conservatives never let down the class that fundamentally they were founded and exist to represent uh, the ruling class. In terms of the working class in all its diversity, it's an important point uh, you make. By the working class, you know, I mean the 99%. Uh, I mean the vast majority uh, in our society. Because I do think, in a way that in much of the mainstream media, the term working class has ended up being used almost in the way that Margaret Thatcher used it and almost in a way that many people use it in the United States, which is basically the poorest 20% in society, the working class, and everyone else virtually is so-called middle class. When I say working class, I mean the vast majority in our society, and I mean the working class in all its diversity. And you're right, these protests and this movement, whether it's on the ground or online, is characterised uh, by its diversity. And I think some food for thought for all progressives, including those uh, in the Labour Party, is in the 2017 general election, Labour started to uh, assemble an electoral coalition behind it, which really was the working class in all its diversity, young people, uh, black and minority ethnic uh, communities, uh, people uh, in unstable uh, employment and zero hours contracts. And they were really starting, we were really starting to put together a coalition which looked like uh, and was uh, and is uh, the working class uh, here and now uh, in our country. And that's what we need to do again as a party. That's what we need to do uh, again uh, as a movement. I always think we've got to be as class conscious uh, as the Tories, but to do so, we need to understand what the working class uh, is and what the working class uh, isn't you know the working class in my view as i say uh, is the majority in society and the working class is diverse you know to state the obvious and it shouldn't need stating working class people live uh, in cities as well as in towns working class people are young as well as old working class people work uh, in call centers and offices as well as uh, factories uh, working uh, class people may have been born in this country or in another country uh, the working class people uh, of all colours. I make these points just because I think it's worth uh, asserting because class uh, isn't cultural in my view. Class uh, is economic. And on that basis, the vast majority in society uh, are working class. Really, really important points. And um, listen, thank you, Richard, for making the time to speak to us. I know you're really, really busy at the moment. Do you have any final thoughts for the people watching tonight? Well, I'd just like to congratulate Socialist Telly on the programmes it held. And it's been a real lifeline for people on the left across the country to be able to tune into your programmes on a regular basis. And I'm really looking forward, really looking forward to things happening in person uh, when things are more back to normal and it's safe to do so. For example, I think it'd be great to have uh, socialist telly uh, live broadcasts with live audiences there asking questions uh, in person. You might need to do some fundraising, I don't know, to get to, to hire a studio uh, that's, uh, that's bigger. But I think all of these things uh, are important. And I think my message to people is that as a left, you know, we can't allow ourselves to be uh, ghettoized. We can't allow ourselves, even after that devastating election defeat in 2019, even though the opinion polls are so bad 
uh, for Labour at the moment. We can't allow ourselves to start to view ourselves as being uh, irrelevant. The left shouldn't underestimate its potential strength. The left shouldn't underestimate uh, its potential influence and the power of our ideas. Because as sure as night follows day, uh, those that run society, including in the right-wing media and in the Tory party and other right-wingers, you know, they don't underestimate the uh, potential of the left. And that's why they're attacking us and criticising us all the time. You look at the manifesto policies uh, from 2017 and 2019, we can build upon those. Those policies are more relevant than ever before, given the challenges uh, that we uh, face. And as we are in this huge, devastating, terrible uh, public health crisis, as we're in this historic economic crisis, then actually the radical transformative policies of the left are more relevant now than ever before. Managerialism and thinking around the edges doesn't provide the solutions to the problems that the working class and all its diversity in our country or around the world uh, is facing. And so I think the left needs to be confident. You know, before the last general election, as a left, you know, we were seeking to become the government and we need to uh, reflect upon that. We need to remain confident. We need to know that uh, left ideas, socialist principles, anti-racist principles, um, the idea that there's something more important than the pursuit of profit. These things are more important and, and more relevant uh, than ever because the free marketeers, uh, the get-rich-quick merchants, those who think profit's the most important thing, their model has failed, it's failed, and it's failed again. It's failed in the pandemic. It's failed in relation to the environment. It's even failed in relation to football. So we should have confidence. And I look forward to working with people watching Socialist Tele uh, on defeating this bill, building a movement to defeat this bill, but also building a movement to create the better society. Well, there you go. Really powerful call to action there from Richard Bergen. Richard, thank you so much for your time this evening. My pleasure. So I'm um, really delighted that we uh, that Richard managed to make the time to, to speak to us. Um, there is so much wrong with this bill, just from a from a legal point of view, from a justification point of view. Um, what are your thoughts, Jane? Initial thoughts on seeing that interview? Well, I thought there was a lot in what Richard said, wasn't there? But the the key point for me was um, I'm I'm very involved in Leeds uh, on. Uh, organizing with uh, many many other groups around stopping this bill and a lot of the people who were uh, organizing with are very young uh, and very new to, to protesting and don't want to give up their right to protest uh, before they've hardly started um, and so they're not quite sure how to engage and so I thought his tips on how to engage in that process in targeting Tory MPs, because they're the ones who will hold the balance of power on this. Labour are already on side on this. I think that's really important. So that's where we need to be pushing our political fire. But also, of course, Richard was pretty, pretty clear that actually protesting is going to be really, really important. Yeah, it's it's about having that 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 grassroots mobilization while at the same time that other engagement with the political process is is, is going on. Um I mean, I think something that's really kind of that sticks out for me in this legislation is all this 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 talk around noise and disruption. There's some real hypocrisy there because I can't I can't see them using this as a way to prosecute illegal hunts, for example, which uh a bunch of people on horseback with trumpets uh, charging across the, the countryside. I mean, this is really aimed at, uh, at, at civil disobedience, isn't it? It's aimed at people who are fighting for their rights. It is. And it's also stuff you can't really measure, isn't it? Yeah. It allows, it gives the police enormous, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Licence. Uh, Licence to just clamp down on anything that they fancy or more likely anything they're told to clamp down on yeah. uh, will be 
stopped. And that'll be all of the things that we've seen that have been really important, like, like the Black Lives Matter protest, which clearly got right up the Tories' nose, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So many Tories have been saying, uh, you know, how they didn't really agree with Black Lives Matter. And so that's clearly one of the things. And that's really important because we've seen the effect this week that those Black Lives Matter protests have had uh, in terms of pushing the American legal system to a place that it never wanted to be. And to be honest, where who would have imagined? I, I, did, I could see um, George Floyd's killer getting uh, sent to prison, but not on a unanimous verdict. That's absolutely incredible. That's the power of protest that's really pushed their judicial system. And they know that that can happen here and it needs to happen here because we also have um, you know, racism rampant and endemic in our, in our country, in our society. So there's, yeah, really important stuff there, isn't there? And I think there's a really important point there as well about, so if you, when you look at the civil rights movement, when you look at the, the suffragettes in this country, um, the trade union movement, all sorts of progressive forces, always at the time, they are resisted by the powers that be, they are criminalised, they are told that they are disruptive and all the rest of it. And then later on, when they've won the argument, they suddenly get, there's a little bit of a rearranging of history and suddenly, oh, well, they did it all by the book and all the rest of it. Nonsense. No one's ever got changed by going by the book. And this book is incredibly restrictive in terms of what it will let people do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And things people might think, well, actually, I I never really get involved in protest. Um, you know, and it's it might it just wouldn't really affect me. Now, actually, all the groups that have been involved, environmentalists, um, and my God, the environment, if you don't think that's gonna affect you in the next 20 years, you know, you you need to think again. But kill uh, uh Black Lives Matter protesters, animal rights activists, of course, trade unionists uh, and, and left wing people. We've had all of them involved. But actually, you know, we've had massive protests this week in football stadiums. Football fans have been protesting. And that's that's something that under this bill wouldn't be allowed. And look how incredibly effective that protest's been. This Super League thing. Well, in Britain, it's collapsed in a week, hasn't it? So protest really works. The establishment know that. The Tories know that. That's why they're doing this. I think that's a really important point. And I think there was something Richard said as well um, that really kind of, it underlines how much power we actually have, right? Where they can't come out and say that they'll, want to, that they'll ban the right to strike. They can't come out and say they'll ban the right to protest. So they have to basically ban all the things that go into that and make it incredibly difficult, but they can't come out and say what they actually want to do. And that's why we've got to resist this stuff. Absolutely. Everything the Tories do. I mean, the fact that they've got our students wrapped up in, in, in tens of thousands of pounds worth of debt so that hopefully that'll keep them under the cosh and they'll need to work and work and work all their lives to pay that debt off and be in fear from that debt. The fact that they've got so many people who are um, who are working for the minimum wage, which doesn't isn't enough to pay uh, all their bills and to keep their you know the roof above their head and to keep them fed, and so those people are terribly um, oppressed by poverty and by poor pay, by everyone who's disabled uh, and on benefits, who's unemployed and on benefits, hasn't got enough money to actually live on. No one can live on the poverty level of benefit that's paid in this country. So poverty is grinding those people down. All of these things, it's all designed to keep your head down so that you won't be spending your time fighting back and arguing back and just stopping people's right to protest, just like frustrating the ability uh, to strike, is all about uh, making us more and more subservient, more and more uh, like, like wage slaves and less and less like independent people uh, who can stand proudly and fight back when things are going bad. 
Absolutely. And I think it's I think it speaks volumes about the confidence this government has in how popular the outcomes, some of its policies are going to be in the coming years, that it has to put this draconian legislation on, on the books. Um, just before we wrap up, I, I did want to talk about we talked about it with Richard, but um I know you were you were at the 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 protest in Leeds and you talked about how how diverse um the 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 movement in opposition to this is. I wonder if you'd talk talk us through that a little bit. It was. It was incredibly diverse. As I say, we had environmentalists there, and we've got a, we've got an, an airport expansion on the horizon in Leeds, and so there's a lot of people uh, in opposition to that. Black Lives Matter is very big in Leeds. They were there in 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 big numbers. Uh, we had all an old sort of trade unionists. Of course, I'm I'm the president of the Trades Council, so all the trade unions were there, which was fantastic. Although we must get the unions more involved. Uh, because that will be another huge block uh, on this bill. We had um, trans activists there too, um, but we had we also had just rafts and rafts of young people um, because they, you know, they they are the most political generation that we have seen. I was brought up under Thatcher, and even under Thatcher, people were not young people were not as predominantly left wing as they are today. They absolutely as a block are very, very, very left wing and they got the worst, most right wing government. Uh, so they've got an awful lot to protest about and an awful lot to fight back about. And that was why they were there and it was great to see them. So we need to help. And that's partly what we're doing today. Help to direct them in the right way politically uh, to oppose this bill. The one thing I would like to say as well, to finish on really, Richard's point, we are don't leave organised. We make these protests, these these broadcasts to educate people about being in the Labour Party and staying in the Labour Party to fight back. And, you know, Richard really makes you realise how important that is because we need a lot more Richard Bergens in Parliament. He really speaks for me in Parliament. I know he speaks for a lot of people. We need more of that. But also Labour are doing the right thing on this bill. They absolutely are. They're opposing it. So we need to make sure that we're playing our part by keeping in the Labour Party, getting more Richard Bergens elected and as I say, as it says on the tin, don't leave organised. That's what we need to do, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. And we we do lean very heavily on Tony Benn in this programme. We mention him often, but I think it really springs to mind, you, you're talking about the diversity of that crowd that they're rallying leads, which I'm sure is replicated up and down the country. It's, it's that, you know... It, it, Every generation has to has to fight the same battle, doesn't it? And that's that's what we're trying to do here. We we, we want you to go into that battle forewarned and forearmed about battles that have happened in the past and educate you about the current battles that are going on. Um, and really, we need to be big coalitions to do that. And one of the biggest coalitions is inside the Labour Party. So stay and fight. Um, support kill the bill protests where you see them support mps like richard bergen who are fighting for you and most importantly do not go gentle into that good night watch educate agitate organize every saturday night jane pleasure as always brilliant thanks matt